Hello once again, I'm uh, Peter VK3YE and we have a session occasionally where you can ask me anything. I was on air a short time before but there was no sound so hopefully you're hearing me okay now and um, uh, we're up to 12 people so hopefully uh, most of you are all back and there are quite a few questions and comments uh, previously, so um, please ask them again as I um, wasn't able to get around to answering them. It's uh, just after 6 a.m. local time here in Melbourne, um, and the forecast is 31 degrees as a top. It's about 13 degrees outside. I'll give you a view of the window outside. It's possibly hard to see, but the uh, um, but the sky is somewhat pink and hazy due to the bushfires, which are about 200, 300 kilometres east of here. And I went outside early on, and um, yeah, you wouldn't want to be spending too much time outside. Um, Okay, to answer some of the questions, um, what do I do as a job? Um, I used to work in the transport industry, um, but for the last year or so I've been self-employed. Less money, but a lot more flexibility and I think more fun. Um, I'll go through a few projects and things and uh, try and answer your questions. Um, so hello to Leonardo, 9A3LET, Andy Alessandro, um, Lawrence, Beat, Dinser Costin, um, YO3HGR. My antenna space is limited to five meters. I want to put a five meter long wire for 14 megahertz. Which balance to use at the base and what counterpoint? Well, for a start, um, five meters of um, long wire for 14 megahertz, you've got several options. It's a quarter wavelength long um so with a quarter wavelength on 14 megahertz um that's not going to be much good unless you've got some sort of counterpoise or or something um, um you, you if you can you'd be better off maybe with a vertical of that length maybe a quarter wavelength vertical if you've got um you know some vertical space um, another thing you can do with five meters, if, if it's a horizontal space, you could make a loaded dipole. Um, you could even make a dual band dipole for uh, you know dipole for twenty eight megahertz and put some loading coils towards the end um, of the wires, and that will work reasonably okay um, on fourteen megahertz with uh, with some loading coils at the end. Or you could experiment with trap dipoles. Uh, you are cutting the dimensions by 50%, but my experience is that you, know, you can use a loaded dipole that's down to half its um, usual length for a full-size dipole and still get results. So, yeah, with five metres of space, you can get on air on 14 megahertz. Um, Leonardo asks, what's better for ham radio, Linux or Windows? I have no idea. Basically, I think if you are a technical geek who likes programming and all that stuff, then uh, then Linux. But if you're more a consumer type person for whom the computer is a means to an end rather than an end to itself, then most likely Windows. Um, um, yeah. Um, so, uh, um, you know, the worry with Linux and, you know, these things, I could be wrong, but um you spend so much time messing around with it that you don't actually um play radio or get on the air or whatever which is fine if you're a computer buff if not um treat the computer as an appliance or as an enabler to do other things um rather than spend too much time messing around with it um Marcus, glad you had luck with the 11 meter vertical wire can you make it better the only thing is maybe make it higher you might be able to do stuff with um extra collinear elements on the end um that would make it hugely long but it's a possibility never tried it but 
I'm sure there's UHF designs for 70 centimeters that people have done that and got good results. Um, Warden, good to have you on, ZL2VS. And um, yep, yeah, um, if you've just turned on, we've got just over 20 people, which is great. I'm Peter VK3YE, where you can ask me anything. Have you ever built any CB antenna? Uh, no, but if you take any design for 28 megahertz, you just multiply its dimensions by, I don't know, 1.04. Um, I think that's the ratio, then you'll get um, dimensions for 27 meg CB. Um, okay, we have had a interesting item of mail. I don't want to talk about it fully because... Um, um it's not yet available but if you are watching matthew uh, i won't show the other side of this envelope but i have received an item with crystals inside these are very special crystals not just your off your shelf crystals um they are operating on special frequencies and they will make transmitting on certain very popular digital modes much easier if you want to build a qrp type rig so um thank you matthew um i have received your crystals a few days ago so um i don't know a week or two or whatever i'll get around to making a project that incorporates them um speaking of digital modes i've already done a video on this i think but um um this is an example very simple um i built it for js8 an 80 meter js8 transceiver um, um the uh, um it's direct conversion on receive double sideband on transmit and this particular one operates on 80 meters puts out about half a watt um potato slim how does a regular ham start learning to build radios from scratch um well, you start by building stuff. Start with something really simple, like a simple receiver, um, maybe even a crystal set and add stages. Try a regenerative receiver, maybe even a simple transmitter. A, um, um, you can buy kits. Um, okay, well, um, but you've already done that. Um, I've got a video of building a simple crystal oscillator. It's one transistor, but that will get you started building stuff from scratch. Um, most important skill is that you can learn to build stuff from circuit diagrams. And once you can do that, then uh, that's how you start building from scratch. So just get lots of components and circuit boards and look at circuits on the web. Hello to Alvaro Gayton, who's watching also. Um, so um, the uh, um, um, what else? Um, I have been doing a fair amount. Of course, it's in the middle of summer here in, in VK. So I've been doing a fair amount to do with um, operating on 10 meters. There's been some great sporadic e contacts. Um, one of my recent videos has been messing around with oblong loops where I built one for six meters and then I added some extra wire to make one for 10 meters. So if you haven't watched it, there's a, a video on that which is very very simple um, um i'm a big fan of oblong loops and if you feed it in this short side middle of the short side then it's 50 ohm so you can um, um, directly connect it with coax cable or ideally a one-to-one -one ballon but you can get away just with a direct coax connection um and hello to ed weimar from the usa and if you've just turned on, I'm Peter VK3YE, and you can ask me anything. Um, what else? Well, um, I have been very busy working on something. I won't say much about it now, but there will be another book coming out. Um, when will it be? I don't know. Maybe one week, two weeks, three weeks, something like that. Probably this month, might, might even be this month. But anyway, um, keep an eye out. Um, what has been my most challenging project? Um, I don't know, um, an SSB transceiver, I suppose. I've, I've built um, uh, SSB transceivers for things. And uh, um, um, one of the ones I built was the BitX. Um, but I initially started from a transceiver from a... Uh, 
I built an SSB rig for 20 metres. I think that was another thing I, I made. Uh, another thing that can be challenging, at least for me, is um, linear amplifiers, getting them to uh, to work. Um, maybe that's the reason why I'm mostly QRP. Um, and power amplifier chains can oscillate and you have to be, be careful with shielding and decoupling and all that, and you can blow up transistors. Hello to G4KDX um, in the UK and KB2UEW, good to have you on. Um, what do we got here? Oh, this is, um, it's got a few bits of paper, a bit too much light there. Um, anyway, that is a oblong loop. Uh, it's 70 centimetres on each, um, no, it's not an oblong loop. It's a, um, um, I forgot what it's called, but it's basically a um, twin loop antenna um, used a lot for computer data type stuff on 2.4 gigahertz. Anyway, this is 67 centimetres in perimeter for each loop. The two loops are in parallel and something like this will give you horizontally polarised operation on 70 centimetres. And, um, um, yeah, um, there's not as much whisper activity on 70 centimetres here as there is on two motors, so it hasn't had much testing. I think I did a video on this, but it uh, looks pretty simple. And hello to uh, Pateris Kane, and um, um, glad you enjoy the videos. Um, I should do more 433 megahertz. Um, um, so, yeah, um, so that's been one project. You could build a larger form for two motors. Um, it gets to be a little bit unwieldy, but you might get maybe a little bit more gain than the oblong loop. But I think the oblong loop for two motors is a little bit, uh, um, a little bit more convenient, um, especially if you want it horizontally polarized and you can have the uh, feed line um, um, coming straight from the bottom edge. Um, so it's good for SSB stuff. Um, now here is a trap dipole, which don't build this because it doesn't actually work. Um, later on, I, um, um, I, I, I made it and it, and it didn't work. And then I realized later on that traps need to have a, a specific reactance around 200 ohm, um, for the inductors and the capacitors. And this one had a much lower reactance, so it wasn't. Um, wasn't working, um, but I, I did experiment with making traps and things. So maybe I'll, I'll revive that project with uh, uh, It needs to be lower value for the capacitor and inductor um, For a 28 and 50 megahertz trap dipole, but in concept, it's it's a good idea um, Yeah, the reason of course why I'm doing a lot of 28 and 50 megahertz work You've probably seen it in antenna videos is our summer sporadic E season um, with a great band to portable operating. Anyway, if you've just turned on, this is Ask Me Anything, and I'm Peter VK3YE. Um, so just put your question in the comments. Um, okay. Um, I see you use Whisper, the test antennas, for short periods in the video. Do you ever do longer overnight tests? Uh, yes, I do. Um, mainly when, when I'm testing antennas from home, um, I've done some longer overnight tests on, on two motors. Um, um, I can leave the thing overnight. A um, bit difficult to do in a park when you're portable. So, um, yeah, um, I, I have done longer overnight tests from home and on on hf it's it's very interesting to see the different dx paths you get uh, when you're asleep so uh, yeah definitely uh, uh leave risk for as long as you like uh have i used the soft rock thing uh, uh no unfortunately i haven't used it and neither have i used soft um sdr transceivers uh, building a simple dummy load uh andy will can't find cannot find 10 to 500 ohm one watt resistors uh, hang on, 10 to 500 ohm, one watt resistors. Cannot find on eBay any alternatives. Well, uh, I don't know, just keep looking if, if there are resistors for uh, 
half a watt, then you just add more and more in series and parallel, um, calculate the values and uh, uh, be able to uh, get your 50 ohm. Have I been affected by the bushfires? Well, I'll just give you a look outside the window. Um, it's, a curtain. Um, it's a bit hard to see, but it is hazy outside. So if I was to go outside, um, yeah, I still can, but it, it's not all that pleasant. Um, yesterday was okay, day before was okay. Depends on which way the, the wind's blowing. Um, but the forecast is for today and tomorrow for some haze. So, yeah, people with um, breathing difficulties, asthmatics, etc. yeah, they've had, um, it hasn't been very good for them uh, here in, in Melbourne. Um, but no, otherwise, apart from that, um, most of the fires are like 300 kilometres east, so I haven't been directly affected by them. Um, okay. Um, but yeah, as far as um, um, but yeah, it's it's been uh, um, pretty terrible. A lot of um, um, firefighters have, have died. Um, a lot of people have lost their homes, and uh, also a lot of um, forests have burnt out, and uh, a lot of um, habitat destroyed for uh, um, for native wildlife, etc. Um, I did a video um, summarising what um, some of the work that local amateurs have done on helping bushfire communication. Not, it's not much of a video; it's just a few slides. But uh, um, you know, I just got them off social media. Um, but I thought um, it'd be worth doing a quick summary, um, you know, mainly as a, a point of record, um, because things on social media have a habit of. Uh, um, even after a few weeks, it can be hard to retrieve them. So yeah, um, yeah, one of my more recent videos talks about that. Um, what can be done with QRP? Um, yeah, and uh, glad you enjoy the books and all that. Well, as I mentioned before, there should be another book coming out pretty soon in the next few weeks. I won't say anything more about it, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm putting the final touches on that. Um, yeah, Northern California, yeah, I'm pretty sure Northern California has, you know, similar climate vegetation and uh, bushfire issues to us. Um, so, uh, if you've just turned on, I'm Peter VK 3YE and you can ask me anything. Um, just looking at scraps of paper. Oh, this thing... Um, What's the next antenna I'm planning on constructing? Well, I was actually thinking of something last night. Um, I don't know if I'll ever get around to building it, but um, it's one of these things where you have a thought, where you sort of just go, yeah, I find that one of my most productive times for thinking is either just before you properly wake up or, or when you're just before you properly go to sleep. And of course, the risk, the, the real risk for the latter is that you might forget um, stuff and it's absolutely frustrating when you've thought of a good idea and you've forgotten it. So I got up um, and, and wrote some quick notes before going back to bed and I'm trying to find them. But next antenna idea I was just thinking was it'd be quite interesting to make some sort of magnetic loop. It would be probably receiving only, um, but it would be directly tunable with diodes as capacitors um, because um, you know, magnetic loops, you normally have a variable capacitor at the top and you have to worry about if you want to change its frequency remotely, you have to think about motorized um, production drives and um, all sorts of uh, electronic smarts to remotely control it and all that. Anyway, at least for receiving, um, I've had success with just plain power diodes for um, 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 variable capacitance. Like one of my videos of a, I think it was a double sideband transceiver used ceramic resonators on seven megahertz. In fact, the Beach 40 um, um, does as well, I think. Anyway, it uses... Um, uh, all, 
or may, maybe not. Um, no, no, I don't know. I think the Beach 40 just used a variable capacitor, but um, I did build a double sideband transceiver that used a variable capacitor, a variable resistor to and power diodes, and that allowed you to vary the capacitance. Not over as big a range as a variable capacitor, but still useful. So if you had some diodes, try to use them as capacitors at the top of a magnetic loop for receive only, then, and you applied some DC voltage up the, maybe even up the loop conductor itself, um, or failing that separate wires, um, you might be able to cover, say, one amateur band or maybe even a couple of amateur bands by varying the center frequency. Um, I do have some reservations about that, like RF signals and diodes. Um, you know, diodes can create harmonics and issues there. Um, you might uh, um, um, be able to you know, have some uh, RF chokes and uh, shielding and all that. And I'd be doubly wary about using that on transmit. But the possibility of a remotely controlled magnetic loop using diodes to vary the capacitance does seem quite alluring, particularly um, if you're using it as some sort of um, um, receive antenna in a, a lower noise. Um, what antenna do I use for 88 to 108 meg transmission? Yeah, no, I don't, you know, uh, don't operate there. I've, you know, I've built one or two FM bugs that operate on FM, but no, I don't use that. Um, um, not an FM broadcaster. Um, okay. VHF contest. Glad you, uh, Bernie, very glad you had success with um, VHF. <laughs> um, okay, um, glad you had success with the oblong loop. What is your background, electrical engineering? Uh, not don't have uh, any formal electronic um, background. Um, what projects are currently working on? Um, not, not very many, but I had that idea of that magnetic loop that using variable um, inductors or using um, diodes to vary the capacitance. Sometimes I get ideas and I do that straight away and uh, and previous projects just get pushed back. Um, the, uh, um, um, what else? Um, yeah, I should uh, do something. A uh, main current project is, of course, the new book that I'm writing. Um, another project I should get around with is making use of these um, crystals from Matthew. So uh, um, there might be some more stuff on digital modes. Are you familiar with NRF 24LO1, etc.? No, no idea what it is. Sorry. Um, and if you've just turned on, I'm Peter VK3YE in Melbourne, where you can ask me anything. Or almost anything. What's the voltage received by FM antenna in microvolt and what's the voltage received by antenna in AM? No idea. Depends on how close you are to the transmitter. Um, and I suppose, you know, antenna gain would, would help as well. And also uh, the transmitter output power would affect it. Um, so, um, okay. Um, I don't have any more to add, so I will um, might make this fairly short. I haven't had breakfast yet. It's six thirty-eight a.m. If you um, and uh, hello to Gellert, and glad that I'm being watched in Hungary and that you enjoy my videos. Can I talk about VNAs? Um, yeah, I should do a video on VNAs. Um, I haven't spent as much time on mine as I like i haven't mastered the intricacies of it um yeah i know that i should do a video on it and people would enjoy watching it in the meantime there are quite a lot of other people ha have done videos on vna so maybe eventually I'll, I'll do one but i must admit I'm, I'm a bit slack when it comes to test equipment um you know, i should take more interest in it but yeah um um that's uh Maybe there'll be a VNA video, um, but probably not a high priority. Um, what have I got here? Oh, these are just some other 
notes. Um, oh, this was when I was um, planning my uh, an antenna that I called the TLI. Um, I'll be right. Um, I'll say a bit more about it in. No, no, I won't. No, uh, there, there's a bit more about it in a previous video um, where I change it between a top loaded vertical and an inverted L and just a straight vertical antenna, not using the top loaded bits. But yeah, these are probably just a few notes from that from about six months or so ago. Um, I'll, I should probably throw this out. Um, I recommend you to try the Nano VNA. Um, um, yeah, no, I've already, already got one. Um, but yeah, thanks for that. And uh, yeah, quite a few other people have tried them and seem to be getting good results. They, I find mine is a bit finicky, um, like the touch screen um, is sometimes awkward. I, I tend to get in the habit of um, um, of moving the, um, um, well, for better term, left and right buttons, even though it's a bit slow to select the numbers, I find the uh, touch screen sometimes uh, not ideal. Uh, what's happening to the bushfires? Um, well, they are still raging in some parts of um, Australia. Um, um, so by no means not over. Um, um, but yeah, there's uh, information about the bushfires. If you have a look at the CFA website, the Country Fire Authority website in Victoria and in New South Wales, there's the RFS, Regional Fire Service. So uh, they have the latest on the bushfires. And B Edmondson, glad to have you watching. Um, Carl, does... How does power into a transmitter relate to power out? Can we tell how efficient the radio is by comparing power into power out? Um, both two good questions. Um, should, um, first question is, um, since we can't have perpetual motion, you've always got to have more power being drawn by the transmitter uh, compared with what you're getting out. And... In a crude way, you can um, calculate the efficiency of a transmitter by the power that it draws versus the power that it puts out. Um, and they, they used to do that more in the old days. They would look at the, in fact, some amateur radio regulations had power limits specified as DC power input in, in some countries at, in, at some time. Um, have I tried S21 measuring? No, I haven't yet, not yet. Um, so yeah, the, the measurement of power DC input, for instance, let's say that you've got a final transistor that um, you've got 12 volts on the final transistor and it draws, let's say it draws half a watt, uh, not 500 milliamps, 500 milliamps, um, so half an amp. Now 12 volts, um, 500 milliamp, you're measuring the current just at the collector only. You can do that with a multimeter. Um, anyway, that is six watts DC input um, into the final amplifier stage. Now, um, if you, um, therefore the output power can't be any more than six watts and will actually be a lot less. So um, if you were to um, put a RF power meter on it and you measure three watts, then that means that your efficiency of the final stage is 50%. Um, there are types of power amplifier stages that are like 70, 80% um, or 60, 70, 80%. Uh, they are more likely to be what's called class C. Um, and that's okay for a CW or FM transmitter because the output stage doesn't need to be linear. But for SSB, um, the output stage has to be linear and is less efficient. So um, you know, it might only be 50% efficient or less. And then there's other classes as well that might be 80, 90% efficient. Um, so, um, yeah, um, um, definitely, uh, um, uh, yes, you do determine how efficient the radio is by comparing the power into the power output, most commonly measuring the efficiency of the final amplifier stage and comparing it to... Uh, the watts that um, is the drawn in there, the DC power in versus the RF power output. Um, there are some interesting videos, uh, Steve McNaughton comparing the 857 and the 817. 
and how much power current is needed to produce that level. Yeah, and another issue with efficiency is that some of the bigger or mobile type HF transceivers or base type HF transceivers are horribly inefficient. Um, they might be drawing like, I don't know, three, four, five amps on receive and on trend, um, okay, maybe, maybe two to three amps on receive and on transmit, even if they're putting out 10 watts, they might be drawing like say five, six, seven amps on 10 watts, which is horribly inefficient. You go up to 100 watts and they're more efficient. They might be drawing, say, 20 amps. But, yeah, sometimes when you drop the um, power on a higher power transceiver, they can still be drawing a lot of current, which is why um, a dedicated QRP rig like the FT817 is a better choice if, if you're worried about power consumption. Um, do radials on a vertical antenna need to be straight? Um, not necessarily. They can be sloping. Um, if you have a antenna like a ground plane, it's sometimes a good idea to have them sloping down from the feed point. Um, that gets you nearer to a 50 ohm match and elevating the feed point might help a little bit with performance. Um, or you can have radials that zigzag around. Um, if you've only got a small lot, then that's fine. So, um, yep, fine to bend radials. Um, um, yeah, just don't need to be straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just not cold. Yeah. What do I think of DDS VFOs? Yeah, I have, have uh, experimented with one or two. Why do I not use them? Um, you just try and keep them as easy. Well, I, I do. I do use them in, in some projects and things. Um, but I don't know um, if you can get a crystal um, for a particular frequency, especially with digital modes. Um, Oh, Klaus, glad you enjoy the show. Um, yeah, you can just build a, a crystal one transistor and you've got a nice stable frequency source. Um, uh, sometimes digital VFOs have phase noise, um, which can affect reception. Um, it can impress noise on receive and transmitted signals. Also, it draws a bit more current than a one transistor crystal oscillator. Um, but yeah, no, there's a, a lot of merit in DDS VFOs. Um, and if you have to buy a crystal custom made, they are expensive if you can get them at all. So, yeah, I'd go with DDS VFOs if you need to get a specific frequency. Otherwise, if there's a crystal available and it's cheap, then uh, then that's a good source. And it's a lot of fun pulling crystals to see what frequency range you can get in a VXO and doubly so with ceramic resonators where you can get even more of a shift. Um, and hello to Donny, K09DFK. Uh, if you've just turned on, this is Ask Me Anything, and I'm Peter VK3YE in Melbourne, and yes, I am live. Okay, I think I, I, I think I've answered everything. So, uh, yep, um, um, I won't stick around for too much longer. If a DXer lives in a city flat, what do you think about an artificial ground for the receiver? Um, yeah. Um, Possibly more for the transmitter, but um, the yeah, main problem in city flat is noise on receiving. So, yeah, um, some people use noise sense antennas where they have a device, I think MFJ sell them, where you can um, use phase cancellation to try and um, uh, remove noise sources. I think that works best if you've only got one primary source of noise. Um, what tools am I using for measuring RF frequencies? I use GOOF. I have no idea what GOOF is, and uh, yeah, I'll go it. So, yeah, uh, what do we call a free running oscillator? Non digital VFOs. Um, we call it, yeah, it's a free running oscillator, free running crystal oscillator, variable crystal oscillator, variable ceramic resonator. Um, oh, um, yeah. Oh, you mean ones without a crystal or ceramic resonator? Um, yeah, just uh, a free-running VFO. Yep, that's what you call them. Um, free-running VFO. Yeah, just with a capacitor and inductor and uh, shielded box voltage regulation. Please let me know on your channel when the next book comes out. I will do so, yes. And you can also follow me on my Facebook page, uh, VK3YE Radio Books on Facebook. Uh, VK3YE Radio Books on Facebook, 
and also my blog called the daily antenna dot blogspot dot com um i have things um most weekdays um little posts there so um i'll let you know when a book is there an event similar to hamvention in the us in australia um nothing as big as hamvention um probably the biggest event is wyong field day which is in in um, north of sydney um um so yeah that's that's probably the biggest um here in melbourne we we go a different tact pretty much most radio clubs have their own ham fest so although we don't have huge events they are conveniently spaced throughout most of the year um so we're fortunate to have quite a good number of ham fests there's probably about six or seven seven of them within easy driving distance of, of melbourne possibly even even maybe even nearer to eight um so yeah i normally go to maybe you know three or four of them um so um yeah they would um a typical ham fest here in you know one of the larger ham fests here in melbourne might get um three or four hundred maybe yeah maybe three or four hundred people in attendance so uh, not quite the same scale as dayton um they just normally go for say half a day from say 10 a.m to just after lunch sometimes there are technical talks and presentations um meteor scatter how long does a trail remain usable before it stops um i think it's bursts of i'm, I'm not sure um i think it varies by band um i think six meters the trails are longer than on two meters i think six meters is probably the optimum band for meteor scatter um but yeah definitely not hours um as for minutes maybe if there are several meteors bursting at uh, scattering at once you might have something longer um but yeah i think it's more um i don't know might be five ten fifteen seconds maybe less um people have had short contacts with them digital modes have been quite good um free running oscillators um um unfortunately they have too much free running um well the thing is that pretty much all amateur radio transceivers including those ssb up to the 1970s all had free running oscillators and some of them drifted but some of them worked and you could build a free running vfo and get reasonable stability um good night to peteris and um the um yeah the main things are there's about five or six really important things you've got to have really good mechanical stability really good quality variable capacitors ones that don't shake when you adjust the knobs on them um they've got to be in a shielded metal box you need to keep heat sources away from your vfo because that causes drift you need to have really good quality rigid inductors so you know if you bump the radio then the coils don't shake um, um you know you need to have some sort of mechanical um um suppression like you might have the vfo in a separate metal box with some rubber or something to absorb the shock and then have that in your main box um so you stop movement you need good quality capacitors the fixed capacitors like um um polystyrene are good silver mica might be okay disc ceramic not so good um you need voltage regulation as well um you can use a three terminal voltage regulator um you can have feed through capacitors um so that electrically you're shielding the vfo in its own box from the rest of the transceiver to stop rf feedback and stuff getting through um you need the dc supply to be regulated and uh, uh, no ac or feedback from other parts of the transmitter um so yeah that's pretty much it um some people use used to use capacitors um why don't polycon vericons use extended shafts yes it would be good if they did but they were made for the pocket transistor radio market where you had just a tiny little knob and you know, that was adequate for that purpose so um some people have made extenders like if you have a look in your you know screw box you might be able to find screws that um 
that screw into the insides of a, uh, a polyvericon and you might make a section of a pen barrel or knitting needle or something and make an extendable shaft. You know, some people have done that. Um, have I made a mag loop from a trombone capacitor? Um, no, I haven't. People have tried with soft drink containers or soft drink cans and managed to find ones that telescope inside one another. Um, but yeah, no, I haven't done it, but apparently it works quite well. So yeah. Um, okay. Uh, 27 people watching. Um, if you've just turned on, I'm Peter VK3YE and you can ask me anything, but not for very long because uh, I think I'll be closing fairly soon. Um, another hint with v free running VFOs is that you would normally not build them above, you know, maybe seven or eight megahertz. Below those frequencies, you'd have you might build what's called a premix VFO where you have the VFO at say two or three megahertz and then a uh, you mix it with a crystal oscillator signal um, say five megahertz or whatever and then you get seven megahertz uh, the lower the VFO frequency the less the drift so you can add a mixer and, and oscillator stage and mix it up um, to a higher frequency but then you need good RF filtering otherwise you um, you might get spurious outputs from your VFO which can cause birdies in receivers and spurious ion transmit so that's another approach would you buy an FT818 or stick out for a decent 817 there's really very little difference between them um, um, uh, I would go for an 817 ND rather than an, a straight 817 um, some of the early 817s had problems with their power amplifier. Um, so I'd definitely go an, an 817ND over an 818, but really there's no significant benefit of the 818. Um, you know, it's 6 watts versus 5 watts. That makes no difference. The standard battery pack is a bit bigger with the 818, but um, uh, I still use external batteries with it. Um, and also the battery pack even with the 818 version is, is still not quite enough I, i'd rather uh, higher capacity um, I, i'd go for something at least um, three amp hour when using the ft817 or 818 as it does use a fair amount of consumption on receive and uh, most of the time you are spent listening um, so yeah the 817 i think draws about 300 milliamps on receive Hello to Paul. Have I compared radial sitting on the ground versus raised, such as running along the top of a fence? I haven't, but I believe that everything I've read um, is that if you can elevated radials, you can get away with fewer of them and um, have better performance. Um, if they are slightly raised, another possibility is you can um, probably better tune radials if they're slightly raised. So, um, if you can, um, uh, like people have done things, I think it's probably in um, that book, Low Band DX Antennas and other sources. Um, N6LF, why does that call sign ring a bell? I know he's done a lot of work with antennas and stuff, possibly probably also with verticals. But yeah, there's been articles in QST about um, a smaller number of raised radials, I think, giving equivalent performance to a bigger number of buried or surface radials so yeah that's something to bear in mind um so um yeah that's all, all i can uh, comment on radials i'm pretty sure dave vk3 ase you know he's used uh, raised radials with, with good results that's on 160 meters Okay, uh, last call for any questions. Otherwise, I'll call it a day and have some breakfast. Now, it's a bit lighter outside, so I'll give you a view of the sky. Yeah, it's a bit too light for the 
camera, but anyway, it's, it's somewhat hazy. Um, okay. Um, Defeated for formula for radial lengths. Um, yeah, there is. Um, I won't go into it in this video. It, it could fill a book. Um, um, but, yeah, some people use shorter radials and, uh, you know, ground tuning units, tune counterpoises. Um, some go for exactly quarter wave. Some say it should be a bit more. Anyway, um, have a look at um, some of the detailed antenna books. Um, when's the next QRP by the bay? Um, yes. Um, thanks for that, Paul. It is. I have publicised it. So I haven't sent the email around yet. Um, it is on um, my Facebook page, VK3Y Radio Books. I have been remiss. I should have mentioned it um, earlier on. Um, but it is... Um, I just... Um, find, have a look, see all upcoming events. Um, I should know off by heart. But it is Saturday, the 8th of February. Saturday, the 8th of February at uh, the usual place um, near the Chelsea Life Saving Club is the next Melbourne QRP by the Bay. So if you're in the Melbourne area, come along to that um, portable QRP. Um, what's my day job? Um, yeah, I think I mentioned that earlier on. Yep, self-employed. Um, used to be employed in transport industry, but uh, yep, now work for myself. Um, less money, but a lot more freedom. Um, and uh, anyway, that's, uh, I think that's all the questions. So uh, thanks to all for uh, having a look. Um, if you've missed the earlier part of the video, you'll be able to watch it on my website, uh, on my YouTube channel um, in a few moments. So uh, thanks to all and um, uh, everyone have a good day. This is VK3YE Clear.